conversation with. Um, a warm welcome and thank you to our speakers mainly, which are here with us to talk about a very important topic. So our open conversation with today is gonna talk about bringing knowledge into action, ways to increase learning in public administration. Uh, also, thank you to the audience online. We can see that some participants are already joining our webinar, our roundtable here. Um, so today with us, I'm going to present our speakers. We have uh, first Tihana Puzic. She is a senior expert in quality management at the European Institute of Public Administration, APA. Then we have Matthias Will. He is the Director for the Research and Innovation Common Implementation Center in the European Commission. And lastly, we have uh, Professor Dr. Stefan Gutenberg. He is a full professor at the EHL Hospitality Business School in Lausanne, Switzerland, and Academic Director at the EHL's Graduate School. Um, it's important to let the audience online know as well that we have a question and answer box in our webinar. You will be able to ask your questions and at the end of our seminar, we will have 10 minutes uh, just for to answer your questions. Uh, so feel free uh, to put your questions there, to engage with us, to share your opinion with us as well. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. And if you allow me, we can start uh, with our segment one, with our first section of our roundtable, with the questions to the speakers. Um, so today, especially, we're going to talk about the concept of learning organizations. And later on, we are going to make a link with our common assessment framework, the CAF tool that we use for public administration and public uh, organizations. So firstly, uh, we know that the concept of learning organizations has become more notorious, especially nowadays in which we try to make our organizations more pragmatic, action-oriented, and fit for the future somehow. In that way, the learning organization approach encourages a collaborative learning pattern. So there is no learning organization without learning as a group, basically. So having said that, I would like to first uh, pose the question to um, Professor Dr. Stephen. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about the concept of learning organizations and how they correlate with the knowledge management and the learning organizations themselves? And we would also love to hear more about the learning leadership model, which is a model that you explained in your last uh, publication, The Future of Knowledge Management. So thank you very much. The floor is all yours and you can start. Thank you so much first, uh, Giovanna, for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, while I start, uh, share my screen, please think about uh, two questions and a warm welcome to the audience. Um, how would you define leadership in our days? And how would you define organizations in our days? And this is critical to answer the question in order to see what the learning organization is. You should be now able to see my presentation. Uh, first, let me explain that we are in a transition at the moment, how we perceive organizations. It's basically what I framed in turning the pyramid around. The classical industrial economy and the classical industrial organization, and I will explain shortly, that has also a lot to do with public organizations, is basically concentrating on the tangible assets, on the physical assets or the financial assets. And on the top, and that has also a lot to do with how we may have perceived leadership in the past, there is small proportion of people running the organization, even smaller critical people, very centralized on the top. The leader knows it all. And I think it's obvious that we cannot go on with such a picture of the organization in a future where we encounter a lot of complexity, a lot of crisis, and where we need everybody and where we need to focus much more on the intangible side than the tangible side. That brought the learning organization into action. 
and one of the most prominent figures, I had the pleasure to work a couple of years together with him, is Peter Zenge from MIT, who popularized the term, which was already brought up in the 1960s. But with his book publication, The Fifth Discipline, he uh, bestseller management book, book publication, he basically uh, draw the definition of a learning organization as we understand it today. He said the basic meaning of the learning organization is an organization that is continually expanding its capacity to create its future. So it goes very much in line with our modern resource-based view of organizations, where organizations are a bundle of resources uh, where you have continually to work on. And secondly, um, the surest way to predict the future is to create it. So it has this proactive role, which is also very nicely here. He has defined then uh, five disciplines of the learning organization. I won't have time to introduce them now in detail, but just that you're aware of. And the most important summary here is, while in the past, the competitive of an organization may have been rooted in the tangible resources, e.g. the financial resources, in the future, uh, the organization and the competitive advantage of, of the organization may root in the ability to learn faster than the co competitors, so to have better learning skills, as already mentioned, on the individual level, on the group level, and on the organizational level. So we have to change the picture also of our organization, how we perceive the organization from the past, which was very much results driven towards what is behind the results. Uh, Peter Drucker, the famous Viennese management guru already said, um, great results should be never confused as the primary objective, but as a consequence of what is behind. So that's very true for shareholder value, but also when we think about the current climate discussion, we should not focus too much on just the goal of the 1.5 uh, degree uh, in Greece, but on the capabilities that will allow us to limit this degree increase, hopefully in the future. And that's here at the core. And that brings me to the learning leadership model, which uh, describes the state of uh, self-leadership capability in an organization as well as distributed or shared leadership capability in an organization. The stage one, you can say, is a very fragmented organization uh, with very low self-leadership skills of the employees as well as uh, not much, much direction going on. You can say uh, the typical bureaucratic organization is this fragmented organization not developing a strong force towards positive results. This next step would be the territorial organization where self-leadership skills, entrepreneurial skills increase. Yes, but fragmented in the functions in the business disciplines, in the business units. So again, it does not make a good learning organization because the learning over the boundaries, over the internal boundaries of the organization is not working. So that needs to be increased by, by what we call the relation-based organization. A strong cohesion, strong informal organization, a lot of networking inside the organization is going on. So that's already good. But unfortunately, the organization is not very open to the outside. So that's the typical organization which have the not invented here syndrome. Everything which comes outside of the organization is seen as a threat, for example, is seen uh, not in a positive way. Uh, the final stage would be really the learning organization with an open leadership model and a um, leadership model that has also defined the purpose of the organization, the purpose together with the environment. Why are we here? What do we contribute to the environment? What are our customers? 
So really a lot of knowledge exchange takes place in between the environment and the organization and the organization is aligned. That brings me finally to the five priorities a learning organization and effective leaders in learning organizations should have. It's really important, as I mentioned, to engage in this purpose making, in the sense making. Why does your company exist? Why does your organization exist? And what makes it unique? Then to generate the necessary attention and attractiveness. Attention is maybe the scarcest resource in the knowledge age, as it was have been financial resources or tangible resources before, because we get all very quickly distracted in this environment and not focus on our main mission, on our main purpose. In order to be able to do that, we need to cultivate growth. And that's basically the team learning role. We need to help each other to invest in the sustainable development of all our people together. The fourth point is system thinking. It's the organizational architecture. It requires an understanding of how can we grow the organization in a way that it helps us to achieve the results we want to achieve. And that's uh, removing learning barriers. We will come to that later, but also fostering learning. And the fifth last point is to create really credibility and trust because we need that in order to be able to share knowledge. And that requires for effective leaders to work on their own mental models, to see them not just as the ones who know it all in the organization, but maybe the ones who ask the right powerful questions. That was it. I think I took more than the five minutes. That's always when you invite a professor, uh, but I uh, hope uh, that lays a little bit the ground for the learning organization. Thank you. Thank you, dear Stefan. No, no worries. Uh, it's a good way for us to start uh, our conversation. I think it was really um, inspiring how you defined the, the leadership, the learning leadership model, as you said, and that we come now into a more complex world and we need to understand how we can be more fit for the future. So less about the leader knows it all, as you said, less hierarchy, but more um, knowledge ex exchange, uh, team learning, how to create a sustain sustainable development uh, of our people, as you said. So I think it's all very valuable. And on that note, I would like to go to our next question, which I would like to pose to dear Matthias here with us. Um, so some of the issues that learning organizations were designed to address within institutions is fragmentation, competition, rather than collaborative culture, and reactiveness. In your opinion, what are the benefits of learning organizations, dear Matthias, but also, on the other hand, what are the challenges and potential risks of implementing this learning culture within an organization? Thank you very much, uh, Giovanna. Thank you, first of all, for having me. And thank you to all those attending at lunchtime, taking one hour to, to sacrifice lunch or having a sandwich in their hand uh, to, to listening to us. Uh, so I'm not here in a capability of European Commission analyzing or possibly regulating anything. Um, uh, I am here uh, in my professional capacity uh, in research and innovation. Uh, we are overseeing uh, a network of uh, directorates general, executives, agencies. So there is a lot of organizational development going on. And in my former job, I was in the commission, the director for organizational development. Uh, in that also, I have an overview and have the privilege of animating a network of HR executives and practitioners from different international organizations. Uh, so we are nowhere, dear Stefan, competing on the academic Academic front, uh, uh, it is a, a network of practitioners, and uh, in in my small interventions here and in the next couple of minutes, uh, um, I would maybe like to offer one or the other insight, uh, a hack, uh, 
that uh, could work uh, or that has worked elsewhere, which might be of interest uh, um, to you. Uh, Giovanna, you said uh, fragmentation, competition, reactiveness. Uh, of course, fragmentation, the more silos we live in. I'm not anti-silo. Silos can be good for delivery, but 100% silo is a brain prison. Competition, yes, a collaborative culture, but competition can be good also for drive. Uh, yeah, so I'm not condemning any of these. And reactiveness, if you try to be proactive on all fronts, might be difficult too. Picking choices, making good priorities is probably something important in there. You asked for the benefits, sir. Um, I think there must be something of a step model, uh, an approach that is incremental. Uh, so I think a benefit of learning, learning from the past, learning from errors, is simply you secure business continuity. Yeah, You ensure efficiency. Um, you uh, provide better value to your clients, to stakeholders. Uh, but then beyond that, and totally in line with what Stefan said, uh, uh, you, you get prepared, you are better prepared, preparedness for the future. And uh, uh, you help create or shape uh, maybe part of the future, uh, despite all those uh, uh, yeah, variables uh, uh, in this future equation. I would say important side benefits of learning not only from the past, but if I can say provocatively, a little bit learning from the future. Uh, yeah, and we will speak about that, imagining those futures, uh, 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 trying to envisage them. Yeah, side benefits of that are that simply as an organization, you will be more attractive yeah. for new talents. Uh, you will retain uh, important staff. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, uh, no matter whether we go to the office, work from home, hybrid, whatever it is, I think it simply creates more fun. Yeah. So there is a purpose. Uh, life is a little bit too short not to have fun at the workplace and, uh, you know, thinking about the future, helping to shape it, uh, being in contact with your colleagues, not only inside. Stefan spoke about the outside and the interaction. It's a huge driver for professional fun. And I think that are all important uh, benefits. So very quickly on the risks. Um, Often it's stop and go. And if you're in a stop phase and then, uh, you know, there is a leading coalition of some who want to reignite. And if you go too fast, you fail. So I would mm, ask here also for realism. Identify those elements where you can create a success, something that is visible, where you create if I may call it the parallel organization. And you can uh, prove to the cynics of which in all organization, organizations we have enough uh, that it is possible. Yeah? And then you build the bridge from today's organization to this increasing future organization. Organization sounds, of course, too structural like organization chart. Structure is not unimportant, but of course this overlay of culture of leadership of mentality is key in that uh, so uh, hierarchy yeah uh, stefan mentioned that uh, can be a problem so we need laterality in it uh, uh, and i think then you know speaking from experience eu institutions compliance drive for compliance can suffocate so much yeah. So you have to see how can you stay compliant, but find smart ways of cutting some corners yeah, to move uh, forward. Could I just try my luck to share just one slide? Um, can you see that? Um, we can see the slide, but uh, not in a presentation mode, but we can see it. Can you see it now? Yes, we do. Um, it's 
again with the notes um, besides. But try to okay. go to the, yeah. Um, is that better? Yes, perfect. Okay, um, I will come back later. We have a bit more time on some practical examples, but uh, I think it is nice to think, uh, you know, individual learning, team learning, organizational learning, and probably everybody has some elements of something, and then see a bit how leadership, uh, and I don't think leadership only top-down, senior, middle, and so on, everybody can be a leader of a group, of a community, of a knowledge center, yeah? The importance of data, technology, AI, and then of course uh, the ecosystem, the relations, and then probably there is this overlay of culture that cuts across. So that is just uh, what I wanted to share uh, beforehand uh, uh, with you so that uh, you see my little framework in which I would like to embed these little examples that we'll come to later. Thank you. Great, perfect. Thank you, Matthias. Um, also for highlighting the coll collaborative uh, culture, talking about a bit about the benefits, so learning from the past and learning from the future, which is very important. Uh, business continuity, efficiency, and also uh, saying that by becoming learning organizations, the organizations themselves can become more attractive and fit for the future, which is basically what we want to even though we have the challenges. Um, so for example, the drive for compliance, hierarchy, but that it's very important to breathe, to build this bridge uh, to the future. Um, then we go finally to Tihana. Uh, here we would like to make a link with our common assessment framework. So I think Tihana is the, the expert, the special person to talk about it. So we would really like to hear from her. Um, so basically, in our common assessment framework, our CAF tool, mm -hmm. we have the criterion number four, partnerships and resources. Within this criterion, the sub-criterion 4.4 relates to management uh, information and knowledge, which is directly related to knowledge management somehow. Uh, we have practices as knowledge sharing and mutual learning, the importance of the leaders in a team, among others. So, Tihana, we would like to hear from you if you can explain a bit more about this criterion and sub-criterion mm -hmm. and how exactly we could relate this, the common assessment framework tool, to the concept of learning organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Giovanna. Um, thank you also, Stefan and uh, Matthias for the great insights provided so far. I would love to listen more and to hear more uh, because it sounds, um, it very much um, resonates uh, to what we do in the common assessment framework. So I'm gonna try to keep um, short so I can enjoy uh, your session some more. Also all the best uh, regards to the online audience. Um, my sandwich is half eaten at the table. So uh, sacrificing, um, yeah, but it's for the learning um, uh, also on our individual level, as far as I can see. So allow me uh, please to um, first say for those who might not be um, into the common assessment framework, what it's about before I jump in into the sub criterion point for uh, uh, four. Well, um, the common assessment framework, like we say, it is made for the from the public administration for the public administration as we like to say and we at ipa at the european um um at the um, um at the european institute for public administration we are hosting the european cuff resource uh, center and uh together with our cuff correspondents uh, europe wide and beyond um yeah we are actually the ambassadors, I would say, of the learning organization and the knowledge management because so far as I could uh, hear, CAF is all about the concept of the learning organization. So first of all, we are dividing the common assessment framework into the enablers uh, a panel uh, where we are having uh, criterion one, the leadership, then two, strategy and planning, then uh, we move on to people, then to resources where uh, the knowledge management is about, and then the processes. So this enablers the results that you, Stefan, so uh, nicely put into the overall context 
what results are about and what they are not about. So the results uh, that we assess together as a group in common assessment work uh, 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 framework, the results are oriented towards um, the users or the clients oriented results, the people, uh, the employee, um, the society, and also the key performance. That means that whatever we have in the enablers panel that we have to evaluate as an organization, it will have an impact on the results, but also vice versa. Now in the whole common assessment framework, learning and innovation is a core part. So no matter that we have in the sub criterion 4.4 that we say here we are discussing the manage of information and the management of knowledge in the organization, but also very much on this individual level that we want to grow as well. Um, it's in all criteria. And also, um, yeah, I dare to share also part of all uh, sub criteria in total, there are nine criteria and in uh, 28 sub criteria. Again, when it comes uh, to the question of this specific uh, sub criteria, now the main strength of all organization lies in its knowledge, like correctly said by both of my uh, colleagues. And this is one sentence that I just took um, read uh, from the model itself. So I believe this is how much uh, we appreciate uh, the knowledge and the knowledge management, but also the knowledge sharing. When it comes to the um, um, to the leadership, I think we are completely in line with what you've said. So I took some notes and saying, um, Prof is fully in line also with the stage four that you, Stefan, just presented on the learning organization. Why so? It is because it is advocating and fostering this open leadership model because the leaders, as you, Matthias, also said, we are all leaders at some point of our processes and at some point where we are standing. So this is the open leadership model where we want to be agile in sharing the, the messages, uh, the, uh, the processes, the bad and the good stuff to generate attention and attractiveness. Highly uh, important because this is where we come together as a self-assessment group from, uh, from different uh, departments of the organization. And we want our attention and to attract what is going well in our organization and what can we improve. Now, let me please say that the um, management of information and knowledge is I'm going to dare to say to 80% uh, highly prioritized action when it comes to prioritizing the actions uh, after we did the self-assessment. Why so? Because the internal organization is always a pain point, no matter how well we do it. And we always want to deliver better. And we also want to be more informed, but also to a level where I want to also to choose where am I going to be informed? And I also want to have different platforms and I want to have innovative approaches that you also spoke about. Now also the shared vision, it is um, one of the first uh, criteria that we, well, the sub criteria 1.1 in the common assessment framework that we check, do we have a common vision at all? Do we know where are we going? Is this something that the leadership has communicated to us, but also on the other side, are we having sufficient information about what we do, about our mandate? And are we acting within our framework and using the full power of that? And then to come back also on the cultivation of the growth and the team learning and the systems thinking, I could not agree more to the overall knowledge management and the sub criterion 4.4 to come back to that. And also to say that how important it is to establish learning and collaboration networks, but also to take care and to monitor a bit at least, where do we stand and what is it that we need? And is it really that the employees are A, having access to knowledge, B, that they are empowered and encouraged to seek for the knowledge individually, but also like an organization as a team system. 
and see, do we have the time to do so? Because quite frequently, we're all overburdened with tasks, 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 tasks. And then this knowledge management comes like, oh, I'm going to do that later. So those are kind of the things. And uh, with the credibility and the mutual trust and prioritizing actions, and at least to have fun, well, um, this is where I could uh, spend hours more um, um, talking about that. But um, I believe I uh, evaluated, um, I elaborated, um, yeah, to so six minutes sharp now. Perfect. Thank you, Tihana. So indeed, as you said, the CAF is a very powerful tool um, made for the public administration to the public administration. Um, and it's indeed all about learning organizations. I really like the link that you did with the stage four presented by Stefan. Um, yeah, that we have to foster this leadership model and the CAF is really in line with that in all the criteria, uh, to be honest, not only the four and that we want to be agile and for that uh, we need a common vision. So really nice um, uh, link that you made here. And with that, um, I would like also to share with you that um, a while ago, our marketing team, thank you uh, for, for this uh, work as well, they shared a survey on LinkedIn that asked uh, open survey so everyone could vote. Um, and the question was, in your opinion, what is the primary benefit of team learning in the workplace? And we had four possible options, which were gain new perspectives, regain knowledge, strengthen company culture and promote diversity. So the one that had 41% of the votes was gaining new perspectives. Then we had a strengthening company culture in the second place. I was actually surprised that the strengthening company culture was there in the second place. I thought that maybe promoting diversity or retaining knowledge would be there first, uh, but then in the first pay place, we had the gaining new perspectives. And then I would like to ask quickly to one of you, yeah, you can choose uh, which one is gonna answer that, but why do you think then the gain, that gaining new perspectives would be in the first place in terms of being the primary benefit of team learning in the workplace? Well, not a, not a surprise for me. Also the second place uh, with culture because uh, culture is often a learning barrier to overcome uh, uh, where I will come to uh, shortly, but gaining new perspective, I mean, it's obvious. Um, when you um, distribute leadership and Matthias said it's nicely with, we are all leaders. Uh, so you develop a new understanding of leadership. We have executive leaders in every organization, but we have also great networking leaders with great personal networks. We have local line leaders with direct customer contact or direct contact to latest developments. You have to bring these people together. The worst dysfunctional teams uh, of organizations are the ones where everyone just did a career based on his or her expertise. Always this person has always worked in finance, has always worked in marketing, has always worked in research and development. And then we are supposed that these uh, people uh, collaborate on top management level. How should they do? They don't understand each other. So job rotation, having diverse career models into leadership positions, is so important and that requires team learning to work together with people which have other backgrounds, other perspectives, which really bring them the value towards organizational learning. Yeah, I also fully agree. I'm not surprised by the result. Uh, and I think when we think of our um, public organizations, uh, bureaucracies, more of the same, ingrained, uh, entrenched thinking. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, that voting result uh, expresses also a little bit the hunger for oxygen, uh, uh, you know, for new insights uh, enriched from really the whole uh, authorizing environment. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I think we discussed a lot about uh, what learning organization is in theory, but maybe it's also nice to bring some best practices or practically how can we really make our organizations more fit for the future, more agile, and how can we bring the learning culture and the shared culture. So with that, I would like to ask um, Maybe we can start with Matthias. Um, we can ask him, for example, uh, for key steps or methodologies or best practices from his own um, experience, if he would like to share with us. How do you do, ex uh, for example, Matthias, in your organization to capture data if effectively? Which tools and resources uh, does your team use? Um, how do, does your team collaborate? What are the success factors, for example? So it would be nice to hear that from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very happy to share. Um, that are not only success stories. There is a bit of experience also from failure. Um, it is not only from my team, but uh, I'm speaking here about the European Commission different uh, DGs, different organizations, and to some extent also the experience from what I learned from other organizations. So, so uh, I will try again to put in this slide. Can you see it? Yes. OK, let's see. So I will just fire at you um, a couple of those elements uh, and, uh, you know, by placing them uh, in this table, you know, I try to see where it fits in best. We don't have so much time to go too deep into it, but uh, Giovanna, I wanted to offer if uh, colleagues, participants are interested to know more about one or the other, I think via LinkedIn, it's all easy to reach each other. So learning rituals. I think there are so many laudable one-off initiatives. Works gets forgotten. You don't find a rhythm for it. It's too much, uh, cannot be maintained, uh, uh, yeah, uh, collides with day-to-day -day pressures. So I think a good timing for quality time where teams can come together and exchange knowledge. So uh, I have run for several years what I call Actualité. Once a week, I had it a bit earlier today, every Tuesday before the lunch break for half an hour. It's a hybrid event, voluntary. We have 30 people in the room in the cafeteria. Some of them go afterwards for lunch together. Um, and then about 60 people uh, in, in, in remote. And we speak about uh, what's new. No acronyms, no administrative boring stuff. What's new? And it's in headline format. People know afterwards, if they are more interested in one or the other thing, who they should turn to. That's one ritual. People like it. There's a fun element. People play afterwards, kicker, go for lunch. Uh, it works. Once a month, once every six weeks, we have a one-day development day. There are pills on innovation, on career advice, something for newcomers, the exchange between team leaders. Uh, we felt it was better not to have different initiatives all over the calendar my middle managers would kill me probably and uh, reproach me of overloading everybody. So we compress it, we can brand it. People after COVID, many newcomers can meet physically on hybrid events throughout a day and there is stability in it. So that for me uh, are two examples of learning rituals. You all know about the team agreements. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not rules. 
how do we work, where do we work, when do we come to the office, and one of the elements, of course, coming together to the office, learning, there's e-learning, can all be nice, but really learning from each other, with each other, including onboarding newcomers, um, doing that and enshrining that in a team agreement uh, uh, works well and is very much appreciated by people. I put it under leadership. It's not meant to be top down only. Yeah, uh, everybody is part of that. Uh, it uh, helps shaping the culture. Then what we have in the commission, I mean, the commission, most of our DGs are organized according to thematic focus. But then there are so many um, with either a legal a program or in particular uh, a country, a geographic focus. So already that is basically a matrix. Uh, and if everybody is part of a hierarchy, you know, we go up usually in a family with a mother and a father. You know, why do we pretend it's so difficult at the workplace? Uh, so why can we not also be in our professional lives part of a thematic organization, but also be part of a community, a knowledge community, a competence community. Um, and we have some of those in the commission. It's an overlay, if you want, an overlay organization chart. Learning from clients, I don't think I have to go much into depth, but I think for many of our organizations, we are inside out. Yeah, we have these units, directorates, everybody has a brilliant idea, yet another policy initiative on top of something else. Poor clients. Yeah, they are in a way, uh, uh, yeah, uh, suffering, exposed to this overload of many things, which very often don't have a great reach. So put yourself into the shoes of the clients. What can they bring? What are they consuming? Enter in contact, and probably you will learn a lot by running a client centricity exercise. Futures Labs, yeah, we said this before, learning not only from the past, learning from the future. What does that mean? Probably imagine different futures and not only, uh, you know, once in a way day you run a futures lab. No, I think you have to ingrain it into the DNA of the team, of the organization to be, to strive to be in a more continuous mindset of imagining the different futures. What is desirable, undesirable, probable, improbable, and then think back, what does that mean for us today? What can we do? And if you do that, not only with your team, again, in this inside out logic, but maybe with other uh, peers, partners inside the organization elsewhere or outside, I will run one uh, in 10 days from now with other international organizations. We don't do it in a physical setting. We do it in a purely virtual setting. So we can mix people from New York with Brussels, from Geneva, so that uh, we are not too incestuous in how we try to imagine the future. Then governance. This is important. Who decides in the end, what is a priority? I mean, it's nice bottom up. You can do a lot individually in teams. I'm absolutely not against it. But then there's time, there's priorities. Some of it costs money. If you if you want to, to use AI, you have to invest into technology. Not 10 different uh, collaborative tools. Better have one and then be clear which processes, which decision making you run through which tool so that people don't get fed up with this overkill of information of tools. For that, you need governance, yeah, involve different people in it. Does not always need to be top level. And then a little bit here, a futures navigator. The other day we were thinking, you know, next year our European elections will be a new commission. There will be different commissioners with their portfolios. We research innovation were saying, well, we need a commissioner for the future. Yeah, because the crisis pop up every day, but research and innovation cannot always deliver for the problem of tomorrow. So we have to imagine what is the knowledge we want to develop that helps us solve things uh, in the medium term and to be prepared. So you need a futures navigator, whether that is a commissioner or somebody who helps steer really uh, the learning uh, and who invites in those, I would call it, organizational 
conversations about the future and about the learning. And maybe to finish uh, uh, that part, uh, Giovanna, is we in the commission have created a one-stop shop, a single point of contact for collaboration. Um, and with it, uh, we are building a growing community of information and knowledge managers. They do not need to have all the knowledge and competencies themselves, but they are the tissue to help facilitate connecting people, animating those communities. I referred to it before as an overlay organization chart yeah, to make that work in practice because people are busy. People forget also when, when it's not becoming part of the, not day to day, but can be week to week. Uh, and I come back to these rituals. So maybe I stop there. And uh, of course, I would be very happy to reply to questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So between the do's and don'ts, I would say that uh, you presented the do's very well. The practice, the practices that you have there uh, in your organization, um, the development day and the what's new meeting. So really interesting for us to exchange uh, this knowledge as well. And maybe now uh, I would like to hear the don'ts. Uh, I would like to ask Stefan about the don'ts. What shouldn't you do in that sense? So maybe removing learning barriers, for example. Um, yes, Stefan, if you would like to have a word on that. Thank you very much, Giovanna. And by the way, I like the idea very much of the commissioner of the future. We should keep that because uh, research shows that countries who have that, like the METI in Japan, for example, are much better prepared for future developments than countries that have not a good vision and perspective into the future. But uh, let me come to the don'ts and uh, especially focusing on, on public organizations. Uh, Tihana said, well, uh, the organization is always a pain and, and don't worry, not just for public organizations, that's also very true for private organizations, what we see, especially when they are growing beyond the startup phase, when they are getting large, when they are getting older, uh, bureaucracy is showing up. And of course, bureaucracy is 100% opposite towards organizational learning. So you have to fight bureaucracy. And why I'm focusing on the don'ts, on the barriers, because often sometimes you can have uh, quicker wins and quicker successes than with the other infrastructure. For the other infrastructure, as mentioned, you have to decide, you have to invest. It takes some time, there is a delay. But if you break down barriers, learning barriers, the success can, successes can show up very quickly. So the first thing I would try to break is uh, bureaucracy. What does that mean? Well, reduce the degree of formalization. Uh, when you ask the question, why are we doing that? And nobody is knowing an answer, stop it. Uh, in introduce a stop doing list. We have done that for a couple of organizations, uh, not to add too many things. Uh, of course, we have this tendency to put again uh, points on the to-do list. In these organizations, we have forced the organizations to say, for each to-do, stop one thing doing so that the workload, the capacity is staying in the same amount and do it with the same responsibilities, with the same rigor, even celebrate in the end when you have achieved, stop doing something, an important thing. So with that, I think you can also increase the agency, the ownership within the organization, self-leadership skills. Then incentives. Tihana has mentioned it, uh, performance measurement. It's really critical. What do you measure? How do you make a career in this organization? We are all role modeling. And if you make a career when you hide knowledge and your power is basically because of your expertise, of your knowledge, the others will do it the same. And that leads to the most dysfunctional organizations when you think about, well, when I want to make career here, I have to hide my knowledge. I have to know something special, which was often the case in the past. But of course, it does not work now and it would not make any sense for learning organizations to 
support this kind of behavior. So change your incentives and make them transparent. I think that's the next step. Often people don't know really what uh, is valued, what kind of behavior, what kind of good practices, and make that really uh, transparent. I think that is something which is important. Then also mentioned uh, by Matthias, the insufficient knowledge transfer with key stakeholders, especially with external stakeholders. I think that is something where we need to keep an eye on, especially in successful organizations. Uh, the first failure of organizations is past successes, because when you stay with them too long, uh, you become a closed shop, closed shop organization with no exchange, what is going on in the outside, what are the developments. And we have so many examples. Think about Kodak, for example. Think about Nokia. Uh, they had huge success in the past, but then they missed an important development. So open up. And for that, you need indeed, you need time and you need resources. You cannot do that with a working load of 110%. Uh, the Japanese have understood that very well. They have uh, academic wise also very good research stream uh, where, we, where they have created based on their own philosophy, the word of ba. And ba means time of learning, a time for learning in organizations and space for learning. It's basically where there is an empty room, but the function of an empty room is that people can come together and collaborate. So in some sense, you need the emptiness, you need the space in order to start the learning process. And that's so critical. Where can you create bus? Uh, Matthias just has mentioned a couple of examples where you can institutionalize this and where you can come together and by that reduce insu insufficient knowledge transfer inside the organization, but even more importantly, out towards outside the organization towards key stakeholders. And the last barrier often mentioned and what we find often, yeah, we would like to do, but we have no financial resources devoted to that. Uh, our CFO basically stops investing in uh, databases, in artificial intelligence, in all the tools we can use. Yes, that might be something, but there is always another choice. I mean, in knowledge management, there are two strategies. There is codification, which requires, of course, uh, IT systems, software systems, which help you, which support you. But if the money is not there, and I always say that of, not just to public organizations, but also to small and medium-sized enterprises, go for personalization, go for the personalization strategy. You can also increase your resilience and reduce the risk of knowledge loss by including other people into your, what I call the critical knowledge base. Uh, include into that, uh, what kind of knowledge you do not want to lose, what knowledge you want to gain as an organization. And that's a team, team approach. Of course, you need two people sharing their knowledge, sharing their expertise and that, but you don't need to invest in a huge IT system before. You just bring that people together and you create redundancies. Redundancies are a good way to increase the organizational resilience for the future. Because if one person for whatever reason get lost for the organization, there is still another person there who has worked together with this person and shared the knowledge before in advance. And don't start this when you know uh, the person is retiring within the next four weeks. Start earlier <laughs> with these redundancies. So these are, I think, the five most important learning barriers, but also what you can do about them. Thank you very much, dear Stefan. I think we have a great uh, explanation of the do's and the don'ts provided by dear Matthias and Stefan. And with that, I would like to finalize uh, again, talking about the CAF tool, then maybe Tihana can conclude uh, once more. Because I think it's also important to see, as you mentioned, Tihana, the use of surveys, the focus groups, the analysis tools, the employee feedback, 
this is all related to to sharing the learning and to knowledge management as a whole. So my question to you uh, is that, do you think that the CAF can be seen as a catalyst for knowledge sharing and learning culture? And if so, how? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, dear Giovanna. Well, for sure, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Uh, CAF uh, is a catalyst for the learning organizations. And the more I listen to our colleagues, the more I'm convinced. And thank you really um, both for sharing this um, highly valuable insights in only one hour. As said, I could uh, listen for some more hours. Um, well, now, how uh, come that um, CAF is a catalyst? Um, if you allow me, Giovanna, I looked into the chat and I see from Christina Pekic um, from Serbia. Uh, she said, in Serbia, we have a saying, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing when there is no exchange flow of information. So Christina thinks introducing learning rituals would help ensure that all employees are familiar with relevant information, especially when their job and uh, tasks intersect. So that's exactly what the common assessment framework is about. We want to know what the right hand is doing and what the left hand is doing and what the brain is doing and how the heart is doing and are we in a good shape so to do so and what do we have to do better but not in a kind of that a um, consultant comes over and tells us well you know this is what you have to do this is what you have to improve but this is really a learning transformative journey made and done and designed from the employees being guided by a very simple framework of these nine criteria and the methodology which is behind also very simple so i would like to invite all the participants to read also through the common assessment framework model maybe we will put it uh, shortly in the um, chat to inform you um, about um, our where you can find it on our website. And basically it is really to come together and to discuss about the strengths, about the areas for improvement and about priorities that we want to do. And again, how so it is really that I would, I could, take, I don't know how many uh, topics which were uh, mentioned by the both of you, but uh, this client orientation that we love to speak about, especially in the public sector, very often forgotten, I also have to say. So this is what um, I also like to ask to the management, who are your employees? Or who are your uh, clients? Those are the employees as well. So the employees are the full power of an organization and then again we have to think what are we delivering to the citizens to the businesses to other governments name it and therefore um this is what we do at the common assessment framework structuring the word uh, work around and sharing all the information from various departments and very often we hear that from the uh, self-assessment group members that this is the first time that they had the opportunity to express their opinion and also to learn from others what the others are doing. So I think it is a great uh, approach in um, fostering and strengthening and empowering also the learning journey within uh, the public administrations. Thank you, dear Tihana, once more. And we have a couple of questions uh, here. We are tight on the time. The time passed by really fast and we have a very interesting uh, discussion. But let's try to answer that those ones. So the first one that we have here is, do you think that knowledge sharing in organizations as well as learning and training should be voluntary or mandatory? And Matthias, I see that you would like to answer this question here. I think it should be both. Um, probably it should depend on the type of job. Um, it probably depends on 
how uh, long you have been, how experienced you are in the job. In the beginning, probably you have to undergo some training a little bit more. I would always keep room for voluntary learning. But as the organization moves along its learning strategy, you have to align a little bit. Uh, then the people and the profiles with that logic with that strategy and at one point when you have people who say i know it all and i dig a hole every year 1000 meters deeper than the year before then that's not good enough yeah i think therefore what stefan said before learning and the question here seems to be a little bit learning on the job yeah, it needs to be combined with mobility, with exposure. So there are different axes along which people can move. And I'm not uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, an advocate of one size fits all solutions. Leave room for people and their preferences. But people who just say, I want to continue doing exactly the same way we have always done, I think that should be a no option. Yeah, so I think uh, in reply to the question, I would mix the two, but not in a fixed formula. Perfect, thank you. Then we also have a comment from Thomas Love. For the learning excellent organizations, key person is the first line manager. We should set a learning example and at the same time motivate for, learn, for self learning and development of each individual. Thank you, dear Thomas Love, for your comment. And then I think uh, we can finalize the. Uh, this session with the question of Marina, uh, how CAF incorporate innovation and future issues? And then maybe Tihana can say that one very quickly and we can uh, finalize this round table. Very quickly, Marina, thank you for the um, question. Uh, basically all sub criteria deal with innovation and also future because it is a future oriented tool. And like Matthias said, it's not one size fits all and it's not like one shot and we are done with it. It's an, a continuous improvement um, um, effort and innovation and future is tackled as said in uh, all the criteria because um, it can it is an indispensable part of uh, the overall organizational improvement. Perfect. Thank you, dear <laughs> Tihana. Guys, thank you so much for being here today, for your contributions, for sharing your knowledge and your time, of course. Thank you very much for the participants online. And yes, we hope to see you soon, maybe in another APAN conversation with, uh, and be also always free to participate on our next uh, roundtables. Thank you very, very much for being here today.